And uh, right now we're visiting with a gentleman who I find, I'm sure you'll find interesting. Uh, he is uh, head of the uh, uh, group here, a uh, religious group called the New Life Foundation, and uh, Vernon Howard is with us right now. First of all, let me, you have sort of set up your own group. I mean, this is correct? I mean, this is, uh, how did you go about setting We started up? about six, seven years ago, and it's based started on my books, which I've been writing self-development, inner development books for many years. Uh -huh. And when I moved to Boulder City about 13 years ago, a number of people who had read the books wrote to me and asked if we might start a study group. So it started small, and it's still fairly small, mm -hmm. but uh, we meet four times a week and go into very deep in helpful practical philosophies about life. Okay, now how deep do we go? When you say practical philosophies uh, about life, give, we, me, give me an idea. Sure. We go so deep that it's shocking. We go so deep into looking into our own real motives as opposed to the motives we present to the world. We look at, um, to see what we really want from life and see that uh, the goals are often very false. And sometimes it's quite shocking because for many years, most of us, when we're younger, we want to conquer the world with money and fame and conquests of the world in general. You get a little older, you begin to think, look, I've been spending all this time and energy getting money, and maybe you get it or maybe you don't, but the point is, what have you got when you've got it? See, so you've got a million dollars, so you've got a lot of people flocking around you and you're going to go down in history. What good does that do you right now if your heart is aching, if you're lonely, if you're scared of the future? What good does it do you? So we say this, question your values and just maybe you might find out that you're going in the wrong direction in life. Not that it's wrong to earn money, to have a home, things like that, but what what is your motive in life? What is directing you? And after going through a, a lot of inner examination, you might find out that life can be lived very quietly, right in the middle of this mad world, very quietly because you found authentic values which have nothing to do with ego enhancement. Okay, but then what some would say that that would be nothing more than a cop-out for people who cannot become successful and cannot, uh, cannot uh, they may have the dream but do not have the talents, the ability, so therefore it's a great cop-out for them mentally. It gives them a release valve because then they figure, well, I don't want it anyway. Oh, yes, we, we insist that people go through life in their ordinary way, they earn their living. Go ahead and do whatever you want as long as it's honest, as long as it's lawful. Go ahead and get involved in life. And when you get to the point where you see that what life has given you, maybe, maybe, as I said, you did achieve prominence, then question your values. We're saying, go ahead, if you want to make a lot of money, that's up to you. If you want to become world famous, that's up to you. But look and see whether you can go to bed at night without nightmares. See, so it's not a cop-out. We say the escape is to lose yourself in worldly pursuits and running around trying to make more money than the other person. We say that that is the escape. The really courageous person is the person who says, just a minute. Here I've been running around getting angry every day because the world doesn't give me what I want. We say that the non-escape starts when you start seeing that you've got wrong values. When you get to see that what you're chasing after, even if you get it, you're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. Is it true that you penalize people in your church that, for example, if they do something wrong, that they have to put an extra dollar into the, the plate? We have our little rebukes, too, of people who don't remember the rules. For example... What are the rules? Ah. One rule is that you mustn't use bad language. Okay. Isn't that a nice rule? Okay, that's not bad. It's no, so you mustn't use foul language. All right. And you, other things, like we'd like you to be on time, things like that. There's not fines, of course, for things like that. We do have proper discipline, which everyone agrees with, which you must have. We don't want people to uh, behave badly. We want, we see that an early sign of inner development is good manners, plain good manners. But don't you think that the majority of people today in this country do not have good manners? I agree that there's, the whole world has very poor manners. Wouldn't you call it poor manners to, to hurt other people, to invade other countries, whatever? Isn't, isn't the whole thing one mass gross 
bad manners. We tell people, this is why we have these, these rules, which are very democratic, by the way. We have these rules. Learn to be an adult human being. Learn to behave properly in public. Learn to behave properly in society. And you're, you're not behaving properly if you are crude and vulgar in any way at all. Mm -hmm. start, start cleaning up where you can clean up with your words. Not that this is Puritanism or anything like that. We say start where you can. All right, so some of your rules are then have good manners, uh, be on time, uh, uh, don't use foul language. But how strict do these rules go? I mean, how, how far do you make them stick? I mean, what's the strongest rule that you have that is the most difficult to live with? Because all those things that you said are pretty much easy to live with. But uh -huh. what are some of the rules uh -huh. that you... We don't difficult. have any that are much harder than that. Most of the, the rules are spiritual principles, which a person can either take or not as he wishes. Uh, we, we present these principles, which, by the way, are from the New Testament, from the Old Testament, religious rules, religious philosophy. But do you believe in God? Oh, yes. Okay. You believe, you believe in God in the God that most religions don't believe in, or do you have your own sort of... No, we don't have a, we haven't created our own special God, and the question you ask is very involved, and I'll go into it very briefly if you want. Okay, yes, please, yeah. certainly. Most people have an idea of what God is, and so that makes the God of this religion, the God of the next religion down the street, the God of the religion in another country. So they all have a different idea about God, do they not? Mm -hmm. We say, and, it, and this is what Christ taught, by the way, that you that an idea about God is not God. That only creates division gods, doesn't it? Many gods, and then they quarrel with each other, just like religions are always battling with each other. We say that God comes, God is before the human mind creates him. Therefore, it is egotism on our part to create the kind of a God that we want to answer our prayers or take us to heaven and things like that. That is a, it's a God that we created out of our own fears, for one thing. Mm -hmm. How many people pray to God because, simply because they're afraid? Mm -hmm. We say God is the absence of human egotism. Now, isn't that a good definition? The absence of, of you, of me, mm -hmm. and of our own desires to create God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? Yes. You do? Yes. Okay, so then you... Well, so you're pretty much in line, though. You're not really too far off. I mean, you're not doing any occult devil worship out oh. there or, or running around the room with the lights off. That is the absolute the last thing we would do. Okay. Some people have said you're... You, where did that... Where? Because, you know, when I knew that you were going to be on the show, I made a few calls, and several people said, he's a quack. Uh -huh. Why would they say, call you a quack? I'll tell you why. Because whenever a small group it comes into existence as ours does it's not a regular standard church of some kind people since they can't associate it with what is familiar in the form of a regular denominational church they wonder about it and they actually you know it's a very common knowledge that people fear the unknown do you do you know what we do let me tell you what we do Whenever anyone says anything like that, let me, we're, we're about as dangerous as a marshmallow. We're completely innocent. You know what we do when we hear those things? And we hear them now and then. We say, sir or madam, please come to our next meeting. We meet at the 6th in Utah, Motor City, a woman's going, please come in and see how, how normal we are. Well, most of us, you know, how nice we are. See that we don't do anything that's stupid or foolish. As a matter of fact, you come into one of our meetings and you will find, never find a more well-behaved, courteous people, which is not a front just for a visitor's sake. You come in any time. Do you think that other religions are, are saying, for example, uh, maybe the Baptists are whispering behind your back or the Catholics are whispering behind your back because they do not want to see your own little group formed or become successful, that they may have started some of these rumors, do you think? Uh, there is, of course, a lot of competition in religion, just as with any any other thing. But we, we don't pay attention to things like that because that... that they, the last thing we want to do is get involved with controversy with anyone over anything at all. Mm -hmm. We just say this, look, we say, here is what we're teaching. We're teaching self-honesty. We're teaching self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. We're teaching belief, teaching belief in God. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is what interests you, please come down and hear a talk or two. Come and attend a meeting or two. If you like it, fine. Come back. If you don't, you, there's no bars on the door. You just walk on it. 
Would you say the majority of people who go to church on a regular basis are hypocrites? I think they're misleaded. Most people are misleaded religiously because they take religion as being living in truth. That is certainly the truth. Isn't it proven by the majority of people have suffering and they have heartache? What has their religion done for them? We say this. If you're really in contact with God, with reality, with truth, with a capital T, if you're really in contact with it, that has done something for you. Now, to say that you're religious, that you believe in this or believe in that, and, and you have a lot of hatred and hostility in you, what kind of religion is that? We're, this is what we insist on with every one of us there. Don't you dare going around, go around and be a religious hypocrite. If, if you're, there's something wrong with you, if you're weak, face it so that it can be changed. We've Our class motto is if you can take it, you will make it. If you can take uh, honest criticism, and we don't hurt anyone, we don't insult anyone, we're very kind and let people be, go as fast as their own pace can. So you believe in them, the other words, you also believe that turn the other cheek. You could say that, yes, we certainly don't. We, the last thing we would ever permit any of us to do to engage in any kind of hostility toward anyone. Because we found out, we found out over years of studying ourselves that hostility is self-destructive. is a gentleman who is talking about the uh, New Life Foundation. All right. And uh, Vernon Howard is with us right now. He, I guess, would be called the founder. Yes, the founder of it. Do you think things like, um, well, the Reverend Jim, Jim Jones incident, of course, in uh, Guyana, does that hurt all religious organizations? Yes, it does, especially the smaller ones, because people associate wrongly, and people also get a sense of excitement out of mentioning subjects like that. It gives them something to do with themselves to talk about. Mm -hmm. And if they ever bring that up in connection with us, it, it means nothing, because we know who we are and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gone under any investigation as the IRS or any government agency? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't. Uh -huh. Are you a tax? Exempt foundation? Yes, we are. We are legally exempt by the IRS. Huh? Uh -huh. Do you feel that churches should be taxed? When the churches, when I'm talking about, I say churches, I'm talking about, as you are well aware of, that many churches are very wealthy and that they not only have a church, but they own property up and down a uh, number of famous streets in this country, and uh, they have a lot of businesses and they make a lot of money, all tax exempt. Do you feel that's Fair or unfair? Of course, the business part should be taxed. The business part? The business part, the spiritual part, should not be. And I suppose there's a lot of work to divide the two, but as simple as that, if they're earning a profit, most certainly they should be taxed on it, but not the, the religious teachings themselves. Before, you, building. before you founded the New uh, Life Foundation, what religious background, what is your religious background? I've been a writer for many, many years, and of inner development books, spiritual books. Um, oh, but I mean, were you a Protestant, Catholic? Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Oh, many, many years ago, I was a Christian scientist as a boy, mm -hmm. as a boy. Mm -hmm. Then as I grew up, I went into many different kind of religions, the fundamentalists, for example, and went around to, uh, I must have visited a thousand different churches, study groups, uh, all that sort of thing, a thousand of them and went to a lot of them and didn't find what I wanted, except for one thing. What I did find, running through all of them as a thread of truth, as a thread, not the whole organization, the thread of truth itself, the very basic principles, such as study yourself instead of trying to change the world. Change yourself instead of trying to change the world, which is not an easy thing to even think about, but I found that this challenge of changing yourself, while very difficult, was the thing that satisfied me. Long, hard work, because I don't want to see myself anything that might be hidden in me any more than you do or anyone else does. It's very painful, which again is why we have our class motto, if you can take it, you will make it. In other words, the, the doctor says there's something wrong with you, we face the doctor instead of running out and saying there's nothing wrong. We face the fact that, that we have envy, that we do have heartache, we have loneliness, and that we, we let God, truth, reality, do the cure. Mm -hmm. 
Recently, the Methodist Church voted overwhelmingly uh, in uh, their uh, national convention against, uh, uh, more or less against this country in the sense of the way we were handling uh, Mr. Khomeini, and they turned against the President of the United States and sent a note of apology to Mr. Khomeini. Should the church get involved in politics, any religious group, do you, do you feel that the church should become involved in politics? All right. True religion is above all human madness. Can you, can you imagine Christ being involved in any kind of a social controversy at all? He, he deliberately kept himself apart from politics, and he told everyone who came to him just, you know, the truth itself. He said, never mind the world. You straighten yourself out, and enough of you do that, then there won't be conflict in the world that very few people want to do that because it's so much easier to say, you change yourself. You change yourself, and everything will be all right. And everybody tells everyone else that, hence the our country was being attacked whether you would ask your members to pick oh, up their arms and fight i did you did yeah sure in in, in world war ii yeah. in world war ii right. you asked your members then to go and fight and to fight sure. for their they country said, come I, I went okay yeah. so but isn't that a double standard though isn't that in a double standard in kind of a way here's one one area you were saying hey you know lay down your guns two men shouldn't fight etc but on the other hand you are willing to fight if have to i mean isn't we're, that a we're double saying standard? we're saying this the world is made up of confused, aggressive people who don't know any other way to solve their problems than to pick up a gun or to throw rocks at each other. That's the way the world is. Now, we're saying just because it is, why do we or any, any other person has to take a side with this group or that group? Why can't you, why can't I, be above both warring positions and say, you know, Years ago, I would have taken side A or side B and said that this was the right side. Now I see that anyone who hates another person is wrong. Now that's not pacifism, that's common sense. Isn't it better to be a peaceful person than an angry person? Mm -hmm. Except you're not going to convert the entire world. Oh, even, even, no. even though you have six million readers, you're not, oh, going, to no. you're not going to convert no. the world. So therefore, um, you might find yourself kicked around a little bit, aren't haven't, don't oh, you? Find no. that, I mean, no. How can your members be really nice and, and, and if they're being ripped off, do you expect your member to be ripped off and at the same time smile and say, you know, I love you? Oh, who's going to hurt us? Who's going to hurt me? There's no way anyone can hurt me. How? Tell me how anyone can hurt me. If you have a business dealing, if, if you have a business dealing and you are ripped off. How does that hurt me? It hurts you because... I'm it, not my pocketbook. Mm -hmm. except, except your pocketbook puts food on the, fam on the table for your family. All your right. pocketbook right. pays for your lights. Your pocketbook pays for your rent. And therefore, you need that income. And if somebody rips you off of that income, you are hurt. If someone rips me off and takes my $500, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and earn another $500 and put food on the table for my family and pay the rent. And you're going to forget about losing that $500. I'm not going to fight anyone over it. If, if he's going to want, um, uh, if someone breaks in my house, obviously you call the police, things like that. I'm talking about taking revenge against people. You don't take revenge against people. It's utterly wrong. It's mad to take revenge against people. How, how can a person in his right mind ever deliberately hurt another human being? But people do it. I, I know they do it. And we're so aware of that. And we say, if you want to injure yourself... Aren't you, though, being a little foolish? foolish? Uh, but it's nice to think this way, but this is the hard facts about life is that it is a struggle and you have to get in there and it's a rough and you get stepped upon and sometimes you have to step back and that this kind of thinking is a little foolish and a little uh, idealistic. Do you remember the story in the New Testament that Christ taught about them? Seeds being scattered. I mean, look what they did to Christ. Pardon? Look what they did to Christ. Oh, they yes. crucified sure. him. Madmen did yes. that to Christ. Yes. Of course. Okay. Remember he uh, told the story of the seeds being scattered, the seeds of truth, obviously, and some of the seeds fell in hard ground and stony ground, and most of them were wasted. But a few seeds fell in receptive ground and sprouted into fruitful trees. All right. Now, most of the seeds is the world. A few people say to themselves, 
I don't want to fight. I don't want to be hostile because I see what it does to me. And Christ was talking, Christ said the very same thing you did in that most of the people are not going to find the truth because they don't want it. They want to talk about truth. They want to talk about God. They want to talk about religion. But what are they hiding inside themselves? See, and we say we don't want to burn from any unconscious malice or hostility that we have inside ourselves. I'm not going to punish myself by, by hating you or anyone else. How do you know that you're right? What has given you the convictions to know that you are right in your thinking and the way you feel? How do you know you're right? Has God spoken to you and told you you're right? No, not in the way that perhaps you indicate. But I know, I know when I was wrong and I can see a world of difference in the two people. I used to uh, want, just like everyone else, to get to the top of the heap and didn't care who I might step on to get up there. I'm not that way anymore. And not just because I'm a little older, but because I've gone through a lot of things in studying myself and reading different kinds of books, of course, and finding out that the values I had as a younger man were very destructive. I saw it quite clearly. And I said, all right, I would rather have a little roof over my head and a loaf of bread and a cup of tea instead of going out and try to conquer the world and have to fight with anyone. Okay. I don't want to fight. Okay, but imagine if you've gone out and you tried to conquer the world, and then with your philosophy, the way you feel, you got to that plateau where you were really successful, and instead of reaching a small group in Boulder City or in Arizona, or writing your books that only appeal to six million readers, that you could reach masses, billions of people, by being in that powerful position to be able to do that. Say you were President of the United States, that you would work that hard and got up to that, and you then you gave out your philosophy. Wouldn't you be winning much, many more converts that way than the way you oh, are now? Well, we do what we can. Mm -hmm. We put the, the books out, and those who want them take them, those who want, don't want them don't. Mm -hmm. Do you sell these books? Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, is that how you make your live livelihood? Uh, yes, I've been a professional writer for 40 years now. Mm -hmm. do, do people have to, how much to join this church? I mean, do, can you just join and... Well, you can't even join. You can't even join. No, there's no membership. You just walk in. If you like it, you stay forever, as a lot of people do. If you don't like it, you walk out. There's no official membership. We want to keep it free and democratic. All right. And you sure. and you ask them, of course, for donations. Yeah, sure. Do you have a set amount, or can they just give anything they feel it like giving? Varies. It varies according to different meetings we have. So in other words... Or if they don't want to give, then they don't give either. Okay, it's but... up to them. Oh, I see. But do you have any members that do not give? Yes, we do. We a lot of people come in free. We have free, free uh, film showings, for example, all around Las Vegas. Uh -huh. No charge. Library talks free. Uh -huh. We have many things that are free, some that are we ask a donation. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Okay. Our telephone number, if you've got some questions about the uh, New Life Foundation, whether you agree or disagree with him, uh, Vernon Howard, that is my company tonight. Why not join us in Las Vegas? I'd like to have some questions for you right now. Uh, so open, we'll open up our telephone lines, and they'll be open right now at 1-800-634-3412. Now, give a call and visit with us tonight in Vegas at 1-800-634-3412. I'm waiting to hear from you, and Vernon Howard is as well at one 800 634 Three four one two. Go to your phones. Give us a call right now. You are listening to. To me, that never sleeps. I'm Dick Maurice. We're broadcasting live, and I want to thank you for spending the night with us. Be sure to watch us on WTBS Superstation 17. Yes, the television show Dick Maurice and Company is seen coast to coast by satellite, Canada, Central America, and Brazil, as well as all around the world on Armed Forces Radio and Television. And in addition to that, it's seen uh, in the international hotels in the Far East. And it's broadcast over WTBS, Superstation 17. And if uh, any cable system in the country that uh, carries Channel 17 by, from Atlanta by satellite, you'll be able to see it. So check your local listings time and uh, uh, day and uh, station, of course, the cable stations. But it's seen on Saturday nights, 8 o'clock West Coast time, 11 o'clock East Coast time. Then in the Las Vegas area, of course, we're seen Sunday nights at 11 o'clock on KVVU TV5, Carson Broadcasting Corporation. That's KVVU TV5 in the Las Vegas area, Sunday nights at 11 and Monday nights at 1.30 in the morning. So you can catch us two nights. Uh, we can catch us uh, if you have cable on Saturday nights, if the Las Vegas area, Sunday nights and Monday nights. I hope you'll join us for Dick Maurice and Company. And right now we're visiting with Vernon Howard, having a chance to talk about the New Life Foundation and uh, find out, uh, well, his beliefs, his feelings, his philosophies. Do you think, do you see your church growing bigger and bigger and bigger? Will I someday turn on the television set and see you on there with Ernest Ainsley and uh, no. Billy Graham? Will... No. No? No. No. It won't grow that fast. It'll grow quite slow. Just a few people every month will, will come in. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the Billy Graham kind of crusade? Are you in favor of that kind of religion? Uh, uh, Billy Graham and I think differently. Mm -hmm. What? Why do you? In which area do you? Uh, I notice the, the or, yeah, yeah. Or organized religion is not for me. I believe that uh, every person has to find his own way, and any organization that dominates a person's mind is certainly not helping them toward the spiritual path. But an individual has to, if I may use the word, struggle inwardly with himself and not be led by anyone, including me. Must find the truth for himself. The kingdom of heaven is within, as Christ said. And over organization or powerful leaders only tend to distract people and make them worshipers of human personality instead of worshipers of God and do you, truth. Do you feel that Mr. Graham with his, his magnetic personality on television, that a lot of people are really worshiping Billy Graham rather than God? Uh, I don't judge Mr. Graham. I leave them to those who want to follow him. Uh -huh. I don't judge him myself at all. Do you watch him? No. You do not? No. If he were to come to Boulder City to uh, to have a crusade, would you go see him? No. Uh huh. How about Oral Roberts? Any of the others? Ernest Ainsley? Do you feel any feeling for any of them? Same way. I feel the same way about them. Yeah. Uh huh. If, if this is what people want, this is a land of religious liberty. They can listen to who they want to, go to the church they want to. And as far as we're concerned, we we leave them alone, and we want them to leave us alone. We do. We do what we want to do. Does it disturb you when you see the amounts of money that the church at uh, their crusades bring in and you and you read about and you hear about the homes, the private planes, the limousines that... Uh, that no, these, I'm not at all competitive with any other teacher or preacher. There's no sense of competition at all. If this is what they want, that's what they want. I have to determine what I want and go after that, which is a very very long, hard, and very rewarding inner journey. Mm -hmm. Another person wants to get rich and famous, that's up to him. I don't see it for me, and I don't seek it. Mm -hmm. What if tomorrow, after appearing on this radio show, CBS or major network said to you, God, you know, we like your philosophy. We're, we're going to put you on CBS mm -hmm. or NBC or ABC, and you're going to have your own nightly show on Sunday nights, and you're going to give out your philosophy. And, of course, you're going to receive for this uh, $1 million a year. Would you take the money? I would walk right up to the president of the organization making the offer, and I would look him in the eye and say, I'd say, Sir, 
Now listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you. If you want me on your television show at a fabulous uh, salary or whatever, I want you to understand right now, so there's no misunderstanding, that I'm going to teach the truth as I see it, not as you want it. There won't be any theatricalism. There will be just the pure truth. Okay, sir? And then he would have to decide then whether he wanted me on or not. Okay, so he, he agrees with you. He said, okay, you can teach the pure truth the way you see it, and your salary will be a million dollars. Would you take the million dollars? If he said, yes, you can uh, preach the pure truth, and you know what I'd do with that million dollars? What would you do with that million dollars? I'd put it into more truth teachings. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't keep a penny for myself. Mm -hmm. But well, that would generate perhaps another million dollars, another two million dollars. So in other words, you could very well end up being not me. Billy Graham. I no. Billy Graham. No. If that, it happened, if the circumstances you were right, you'd, be, you'd, you'd take the offer, though. The circumstances yep. were right. Look, in the first place, it wouldn't happen. When I go to the uh, president of the network or the studio or whatever, and I say, I'm going to teach the pure truth, he's going to say, we can't have you on. Do you know why? Why? Because the truth is the most offensive product on earth. And he isn't going to offend all those millions of people. He, uh, my, I open my mouth the first time, and he's going to—they're going to throw the switch on me. Well, what would you say? They would—they would possibly throw the switch at you. I, uh, for example, you have said you have said to live decently, don't swear, uh, you know, uh, treat your fellow man with kindness. Everything you said, there would be no reason why he would pull the switch. What would you tell them? Would you tell them not to buy certain products? Oh no, nothing like that. Okay. I would say, ladies and gentlemen of this. 10 million audience. Mm -hmm. Look at Well, if, if it's a network, you're doing better than 10 million. <laughs> oh, okay, you make it as much as you want. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, look at your lives right now and see what a mess it is. Look how much envy and pettiness and self-pity you had just in the last 24 hours. There goes the switch right now. Do you know why? Because you're not flattering people. You're not telling them what they want to hear. And yet, now, did I insult anyone? No. Didn't I invite them into an honest and self-investigation of themselves so that the, doc the doctor is truth, so that the doctor, which is truth, can then cure the, the patient who admits that there's something wrong? How can an ordinary medical doctor cure someone unless he comes and says, doctor, I had a little pain. See, we won't admit that there's something wrong with us. On the surface, yes, just to look honest on the surface. But when I said, when get started to talk and say, now all of you look at yourself. Now look, I'm just talking about the last 24 hours. Look what a, look, look what a dreadful thing your whole life has been. How you're afraid you're going to lose someone. Wife going to lose a man in their life or vice versa. Don't you know, ladies and gentlemen, that God says that you don't have to live in fear at all? That's what I would say. Now, it's up to him. If he wants to put me on, fine. Let's see if he does. Hold on. I give my company to Vernon Howard. I'm Dick Maurice. If you'd like to contact Vernon Howard, you can. All you have to do is drop me a note here at the Riviera Hotel. Vernon Howard, care of Dick Maurice, Riviera Hotel, Las Vegas, Nevada. And I will see to it that he gets the mail and forward it on to him. Uh, Vernon Howard, care of Dick Maurice, Las Vegas, Nevada, the Riviera Hotel, of course. And, of course, he is the founder of the New Life Foundation. He has six million worldwide readers through his books. And we're having a chance to visit with him tonight. But, however, everything you said, you know, before, I, I would swear that I've heard Billy Graham say the same thing. He, he'll tell you, you know, you've had misery in your last 24 hours. Here's your chance to do something about it. Turn to God. Ernest Ainsley's told you, haven't you... Haven't you had a rough time today? Don't you feel terrible? Last 24 hours, you can do it. So far, you have not really said anything that would offend me. Okay. Or offend a network. Exactly. Want to hear something different? Yes. I want to hear something different. Okay. Okay. Think very carefully and very deeply of what it means to face yourself inwardly until it hurts. Where am I? Where are you? Where is someone else? hiding something inside, hiding it inwardly while outwardly pretending to be loving, pretending to be happy, pretending to be fulfilled. Face yourself, man, and see that it's a stage performance, which it is. 
How many, haven't you had experience with people where you, you know, they're outwardly free and happy and all that, you know, relatives at home or whatever, and you just touch them right in the place where they were hiding something and they jumped a mile, they got mad at, you know, you've had those. Yes, of course. Right. 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 This is what we're after. We're trying to get beneath the masks and the stage costumes that everybody wears because those costumes are very painful and they wear you out. You have to put them on every morning and take them off at night and you have to change them frequently during the day. We're saying that people are not what they seem. And a person who wants to really change from the inward out, change his heart, has to go through the very painful process of seeing, quite frankly, that we've been hypocrites all our lives. Now that's the difference. This is not just a, a salve to put on the outside, but a very rough operation. All right. Say you go around being rude to people and being harmful. That's the last thing you must do. We're saying to that man, can't you see, sir, that you that you're hiding something deep inside of you that you don't want to see, that if you were to face it, you could change it, then you would suffer from being yourself. What do you think people suffer from? They suffer from being who they are and what they are. Again, anger again? When a man is angry, what is he suffering from? His anger. A person wants revenge, what's he suffering from? His own angry revenge, right? Mm -hmm. We're saying start and change that. Then you won't be created by the intellect, and when you understand that, the intellect no longer creates time, and then you're in this heaven. I use that as a figure of speech, you mm -hmm. understand, not with a bunch of angels flying around, but an absence of intellectual thought which is negative, that is heaven, where you're not nagging yourself, where you're not in self-conflict. That's what heaven is, and it exists, can, can exist right now when you're aware instead of in into the intellect. Do we go this way only once, or do you think we come back? You can find that out for yourself by what we call waking up, which Christ talked about too. Find, find out what your state is right now. What is your position right now? including those listening to us. What is your condition right now? Is it troubled? Why don't you change it now so that the very idea of a future heaven vanishes because you have it right now with the absence of yourself, mm -hmm. of your usual nagging, egotistical self. Mm -hmm. But I'm really, what I'm really saying is, do you believe in reincarnation? Do you think you'll, you'll no, be back? Oh, no, no, I mean, Vernon Howard is going to pass his way just once. No, no, once. no. Reincarnation is out. Okay, but you believe your soul leaves your body and goes... To, goes beyond, don't you? Yeah, well, when when the body dies, then the spirit certainly continues, yes. Okay, so it isn't a final, when you put in that ground for the final... Oh, no, there, there's some, it's if you're talking about life after life, most certainly, yes. Uh, you do believe But it can start right now while you're in the physical body. You can be, you can be free of yourself right now if you want to be. When you meet the big boss in heaven, what's the first question that you're going to ask God? When you ask a question like that, that's assuming that there's a, a division between God and man. And when you're in a state of understanding there is no division, which does not mean that you are God or anything like that. It simply means that there's no division. You see, we, as I, we started off earlier, people create their own gods and pray to them. And they pray to God to uh, take care of them and when they're weak and all that. There is right prayer, and that prayer is, God, tell me how to wake up. I've been asleep all my life. I've been punishing myself all my life. That's a good prayer. Vernon Scott, uh, Vernon Howard, rather, has been our guest tonight. I want to thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you. I want to thank Fred Travelina for telling us about some of his very bizarre, unusual ESP experiences. I hoped and uh, you found them enjoyable. And I want to thank you for joining us. I hope you'll join us on our next broadcast from the city that never sleeps, Las Vegas. And until uh, next time, this is Dick Maurice thanking you for visiting with us. And until next time, good night from Vegas. Yeah.